Here it comes. OTB sticks it in. And Kanu makes the call. Son, I would tell you this much, son. I would never have put more 3,000 with two tens. Oh, here we go. That's why they sent me. I am like, but. What's up, guys? My name is Carl here, aka Freed Mulders, or the other way around. Back with another YouTube video for you guys. And well, before we analyze this amazing hand, I want to have a quick chat about the reason why I even thought about that hand again. So last week, Upswing released the advanced cash game course by old school legend Kanu7, Alex Miller, one of the new school, old school crushers. So by now he's kind of old school, but a couple of years ago he used to be the, the new school of crushers. Then all of a sudden he seemingly retired, but allegedly he's been in the lab for a full year and now he's coming back with this amazing course on upswing poker. Now leading up to this course, he did some Q&A session on Reddit and on Twitter probably, uh, and I'll link the Reddit thread down below. And in the Reddit thread, somebody mentioned this hand that we're about to analyze. And I remember this hand. Uh, <laughs> I was amazed by it when it happened. And yeah, it was for sure a uh, much talked about hand and like, whoa, what a couple of sickos those guys were. And that hand happened to be versus none other than OTB Red Baron back in the days when there was no talk about Linus Love. Like, who the fuck is Linus Love? No, OTB Red Baron, the man, the myth, the legend. That was also the biggest hand that OTB Red Baron ever played in his career, at least on Poker Stars, according to High Stakes DB. Okay, so this hand takes us all the way back to 2015. I can't believe it has been that long. So it's a three handed game on Poker Stars, no limit hold'em. Stakes are 200 400, so that's that really is the small and the big blind. So it's a 40k minimum buy in, and it's a three handed game between the man, the myth, the legend OTB Red Baron. Before anyone had ever heard of Linus Love, there was OTB crushing the opposition, but also new upswing coach Kanu 7, Alex Miller. And then finally, we have Race Wands, also known as Phil Ivy, another legendary poker player. So the funny thing is that at this three-handed online table, Phil Ivy was probably the mark. That's, that's really funny to, for Phil Ivy to be the mark at the poker table. But Phil Ivy, I'm guessing he's going to be way more comfortable with these crazy stakes. So maybe... He thought he had his own edge in some way. So this was the three-handed action going on at the time. Notice that all players are over 300 big blinds deep, which will lead to some crazy action. So pre-flop, we're gonna see Phil Ivy fold. Kanu is gonna open the small blind to 3.5 BB. And OTB is gonna make the call. So I'll pause the action there. I'm gonna try to mention the pot amount in big blinds. I think that that makes it a bit easier for us mere humans to think about this pot instead of just seeing random big numbers. I think it makes a bit more sense to think in uh, big blinds. So Kanu opens to 3.5 big blinds. I'm not really sure if he was playing with a mixed strategy, meaning that he limped some part of his range in the small blinds and opened some part of his range. Doesn't really matter for this hand, but in general, it, it could have an impact on how the hands play out. But yeah, it doesn't really matter for this hand. But what's interesting is that he opens to 3.5 BB. I think that 300 big blinds in position, OTB can call a bit wider than he could 100 big blinds deep because there's so much money left to play. I think some of the more marginal calls or folds 100 big blinds deep can become profitable calls 300 big blinds deep because he can leverage such a big amount of money that he has behind any S position. So maybe for those reasons, Kanu decides to open to 3.5 BB instead of 3 BB because he wants to make OTB pay a higher price for seeing a flop. And I'm guessing 
like Kanu's life is gonna be hell when he opens and gets called white range versus white range 300 big blinds deep and he's out of position versus an extremely good player that's just asking for trouble so opening a bit tighter and for a bigger size kind of makes sense but that's just to justify his this 3.5 pb open not that relevant for this hand but i'm just making the case for otb calling a bit wider in position because there's so much money left to play and he has position so moving on to the flop so the flop is king nine three rainbow which is going to be a highly favorable opener for the small blind because the big blind will three bet a lot of hands that are strong on this board like the ace king king queen suited king jack suited pocket nines so by just flatting pre-flop the big blind basically removes a lot of the strong hands out of their range on a board like this so this is the kind of board that really favors the preflop razor and i do expect a high frequency of c bets on this board by the small blinds even 300 big blinds deep like you, you could say 300 blinds deep we need to be a bit more careful not put too much money in the pot but small blind has such a big advantage that i still expect a lot of betting but kanu will see will kanu i mean will make the check and then it's gonna be on OTB and it's gonna make a bet in position. I don't really like how this replayer displays the pot because OTB's bet is already added to the pot. So actually OTB is betting, betting this 1.7k into a pot of 2.8k and not into a pot of 4k. So that's about a bet of 61%. So first of all, I want to say, because this board is so highly favorable for Kanu, he's not supposed to do any overfolding versus this bet. He should be able to construct a decent checking range that is not overfolding and that is able to offer resistance versus the bets OTB might put in. So good board for Kanu and he will have an easy time defending his flopping ch flop checking range with a variety of pairs. And he will also have some backdoor draws and ace highs and stuff that he puts into his check calling range to show up with all kinds of stuff. Favorable board for Kanu and he should be able to defend his checking range. Also king high board. So the top pair from the flop is going to be pretty good on mo It's still going to be pretty good on most rivers. Meaning Kanu can check all the flop with some strong top pairs. That's also related to the bet sizing OTB is using here. So... On some lower boards, it makes sense to make a smaller step in position as the big blind. But on ace high, king high, queen high boards, OTB shouldn't be betting too thinly or too wide. He should bet stronger, a stronger range in general, general, or the threshold for value slash protection should be higher. And that means it should also go hand in hand with a bigger bet size. So. OTB goes for 61% pot here, which uh, seems fine. You could go a bit bigger, a bit smaller. You can definitely just go small as an exploit versus people who are overfolding. But we're, we're amongst good players here at the 200-400 game. So I'm just thinking they're going to try to play some kind of GTO-related strategy, at least on earlier streets, maybe on later streets. Exploits might play a bigger role in the decisions but on earlier streets i think people will just try to emulate what they think is a gto strategy so otb goes for this bet value hands he has obviously he has pocket threes king nine suited uh, probably nine three suited some king nine off so those are strong value hands but he is still gonna bet a lot of his kings in position now you could make your life easy and think about it as in I'm going to bet top pairs that are above a certain threshold and check top pairs that are below a certain threshold. Let's say you're going to bet king eight or stronger and check back weaker. But a GTO approach or a solver would love to bet more of a mixture of a variety of kings. Uh, so let's say king five suited. If you bet this one on the flop, when you hit a five on the turn, you hit some new strong hands. So if you bet a variety of kings, you will have more new strong hands to turn so you can continue with a good barreling range on a variety of turns 
That said, you will still prefer, slightly prefer to bet more often with the stronger kings than with the weaker kings. Then you will be betting some 9x. So that's still for value, but they don't really mind picking up the pot already. Ace 9 is going to be bet most often. And then you yeah, have a variety of other 9s, uh, but mostly Ace 9 and then dropping down quickly. And I also think you're more going to be more inclined to bet the 9s with a backdoor draw. It's always nice to be able to turn extra equity in a pot that you just made bigger. So that's it for the, the flop value bets, uh, more or less. Then looking for bluffs. We have a bunch of obvious clear bluffs. The gut shots that we hit on this board. So queen 10, queen jack, jack 10. But that's not enough. So we're going to need to look for more bluffs here. To find as extra bluffs, we don't really have any natural bluffs any draws with equity here. So to find extra bluffs, we will need to look for backdoor draws. So hands that bet a flop and can turn a nice draw, nice extra equity to barrel on. So the first tier of extra bluffs that might come to mind are gonna be hands like queen x suited, jack x suited, 10 x suited, all with a backdoor flush draw, preferably. So those hands, well, first of all, they can turn that flush draw. That's a nice hand to barrel. But nice bonus of these hands is on the turns that connect with your flopped gut shots. So let's say the turn is a queen, 10 or a jack. You will have some new strong hands to barrel, your gut shots that just hit. And you will have some natural bluffs to go with those backdoor gut shot, backdoor flush draw hands you bet on the flop. Let's say the turn is a 10. Now uh, all of a sudden you have some queen x and jack x that can go in that betting range as a bluff to have some bluffs that now go with the queen jack that just turned a straight. So those are the first extra bluffs that come to mind. Then you can look a bit lower. You can look at the hands that connect with the 9. So 10, 8, 10, 7, 10, 6. Those are especially nice categories of the suited tens because they can turn extra equity when the turn is an eight, a six or a seven. So they got that going on, but you can also go even lower to look for extra backdoor flush draw, backdoor straight draw kind of hands. So the bottom card is a three. So we would like a hand consisting out of two cards that are as close as possible to the three. Hands like five, four and for two they are as close to the three as possible and those kind of hands will be able to turn two kinds of open enders so the four two hits an open ender on a five or an ace and the five four hits an open ender on a six or a deuce so those are hands we should look to bluff with and like seven five is also interesting because it can hit it's a gut shot on the six, right? No, it's more than a gut shot. It can hit a double gutter on the six. So on the top end and on the bottom end. And then we could also bluff with some extra hands in that general area. Hands with a backdoor flush draw and a backdoor gut shot. They offer us some nice barrel potential. So yeah, that's, that's a lot of stuff going on on the flop. A lot of variety of different kinds of hands that could look into betting but that's because we want to bet in such a way on the flop that on as many turns as possible we have a nice barreling range a nice a nice selection of good bluffs and good value hands to go with those bluffs you can think about poker as just trying to set yourself up for favorable river spots or while well, picking up the the pot before we reach the river but what is a favorable river spot? It's one where we have a really nice polarized betting range of really strong value hands and then some nice bluffs to go with that. So flop play is in a way setting yourself up to reach such favorable river spots. And to do that, you need to cover all kinds of turns and all kinds of rivers with your flop bluffs or backdoor bluffs. So if you want to show up with good bluffs on some turns, you need to have bet those hands on the flop and same goes for the river. So you will see that a GTO strategy or emulation of that or a solver strategy often has like a variety of 
bluffs on the flop that might not make perfect sense, but they start making more sense once you see how the solver follows it up on the turn and the river. And well, I expect these guys to know what they're doing. So I expect OTB to have some kind of betting strategy like that. So OTB goes for the bet, Kanu goes for the check call. And we hit a six of clubs on the turn. OTB will overbet and Kanu will call. So let's discuss this turn. With, with every bet that goes in, ranges start to get more polarized. So the threshold for betting for value on the turn is going to be higher than the threshold for betting for value on the flop. So on the flop, you could still bet a nine kind of for value, but on the turn, those hands will be checking back. OTB will or should be check checking back with some weaker kings and his betting range should start to be more polarized. And I think it definitely makes sense for him to have an overbetting range here, really polarize that range already. So in that overbetting range, he's going to have some of his stronger value hands that will continue to bet on a brick river. But he will also put some value hands in there that want to get value now, but will likely check back a brick river. So maybe he still overbets with a hand like King Jack or King Tan here on this turn, but they will check back the river. While a hand like King Queen might overbet the turn and still go for a river barrel. That's in addition to his really strong value hands, like a bunch of two pair, that set of threes. And we already discussed on the flop how a good flop betting range is setting yourself up to have good bluffs on a variety of turns. So we can look at this sixth turn and think about how it interacts with OTB's flop betting range, flop bluffing range. So we have the backdoor flush draw appearing. So we already mentioned that OTB should be betting a bunch of backdoor flush draws on the flop. So those are kind of good natural bluffs. He still has a ton of gut shots and open enders. So those also all make nice bluffs. And betting all of them is probably overdoing it because he has too many possible draws going on. So he needs to be selective in some way. Um, but it's also important to remember that when OTB checks, he goes to the river. He immediately gets to see the river card. So it's no disaster when he checks back a bear flush draw here because he can still hit his flush on the river. And if Kanu leads into him, he can raise this river with his flush. If Kanu checks to him on a brick river, he can still go for a bet check bet with some of that air that checked back on the turn because he will hit some new strong hands that will be able to value bet. But he will also have some hands that bet the flop for value, check the turn, but then on the river versus a check, they can reopen the action and bet for value. Plenty of draws to choose from, um, plenty of options here. I'd say he should be barreling very often with flush draws, especially the ones that block some kind of straight. So, I mean, block a straight, block a straight on the river, but basically every hand will block a straight on the river. So maybe you need to pick a hand that will block two different kinds of straights on the river. So they offer you more options on the river. Let's say a hand like Jack-7 can block a gut shot completing on the top, but also a straight uh, below the nine, something like that. Then if you look at the gut shots, um, we're, we're going to be more inclined to barrel with the offsuit Queen Jack, Queen 10, Jack 10s that have a club because those block some of the continuing range of Kanu on the turn, but they also offer us some nice natural bluffs in case a flush completing river hits. So OTB went for the, the small overbet. It's 1.37 times spot. By the time Kanu check calls here, his range is gonna be pretty strong already. So he's still gonna have all the top pairs he check called with on the flop. He's gonna be folding some of his nine eggs by now. Um, and I'm guessing he still has some ace high flush draws. Um, usually people have some lower pairs with a flush draw in this spot, but Kanu doesn't, just doesn't have that many suited three X here. Um, he will have more suited hands when they, they are a different pair. So yeah, that's, that's the action up until the turn. And then we will go to this very interesting river. So 
So the river is an offsuit deuce. And OTB goes for the all in. And Kanu makes the call. So yeah, this is some pretty crazy action, especially back in those days. It was even crazier by now. I think people have gotten more used to this crazy overbet action. But in those days, that was, oh my God, that's, that's a sickos in action. So OTB basically is covering Kanu. So he's basically jamming 111k into a pot of 22.8k which is 4.8 times pot. So I already mentioned that with every extra bet that goes in, ranges get more and more polarized and they are of course the most polarized on the river. And in position as the aggressor on the river, especially with a lot of chips behind, it basically always makes sense to develop multiple bet sizings that you want to use and in general when you have some kind of nut hands that your opponent doesn't have or doesn't have enough of you will always want to jam those on this deuce river otb will have some five fours which kanu will basically never have and it's in otb's best interest to just jam those otb likes big bets just like i do and if if you don't know why that's important please check out my big bets video which i'll link somewhere but the short version is that when you are in a situation of a polarized range of nuts and air versus a range of bluff catchers the bigger you can bet on the river the higher amount of ev you can extract from the pot on average yeah if there's more stack stack depth behind the bigger you can bet the more you will win on average out of the pot so it's really important from a gto sense to bet as big as possible in those situations and otb knows this and otb does this so this big river betting range 5-4 is the one hand otb has that kanu can't but i'm guessing that pocket trees and king nine suited are also still going to be strong enough to bet almost five times pot with on this river kanu will need to call with worse hands often enough or he will be exploitable and overfolding and nobody wants that right now i also think that otb should probably have a regular bet size on this on this river let's say 60 to 70 percent pot and maybe also a smaller overbetting range of 1.5 to 2 times pot so smaller overbetting range will be driven by some weaker two pairs like let's say king three suited and king six suited and then maybe some weaker hands will prefer a regular bet size. So let's say king queen as the worst value hand there. Might seem a bit obvious, but that's really what's going on on the river when you're at least in position. When you're thinking about splitting up your range into multiple bet sizes, you really have these blocks of different value hands that will go with a certain bet size. And if you want to not be exploitable you will probably need to put some of the stronger hands into some of the the weaker bet sizes because let's say on the river otb is only betting for the 60 percent pot size with king queen then if kanu knows this he can check raise all his king queen plus for value and uh the more often he can check raise for value the more often he can bluff and all that so otb really wants to have some of those stronger hands in some of the smaller bet sizes to discourage Kanu from trying to exploit him. Now, versus a player who's not aware or, or is not going to take advantage of this, you don't need to give up. You can just bet according to your hand. Those are the value bets. Then you're going to add the correct amount of bluffs to each of those ranges. And voila, you're almost playing something like GTO. So let's do some quick math here. Um, so I'm going to be thinking in terms of pots to make the calculations easier. So OTB is betting 4.8 times pot to win pot. So the calculation to see how often this needs to work for him to break even with a bluff is as follows. So this bluff, if he would be bluffing, uh, needs to work 82.8% of the time. So let's make it 83% of the time. Meaning that Kanu versus this huge bet is allowed to fold 83% of his river range. 
that's a lot. So he only needs to call with 17% of hands here. So he already ended up calling the turn with a reasonably strong range. And then on the river versus this huge bet, he's going to be folding a bunch of top pairs. So let's think about his best bluff catchers. Obviously, King-9 is going to be an epic bluff catcher because it ties with some of the value hands OTB has. If OTB jams the river with King-9 for value, a bluff catch with King-9 in Kanush shoes is mandatory. Now, some other two pairs are going to be good bluff catches um, because they block some of the King-9 or they block bottom set. Uh, but other than that... Uh, hands like king 5 and king 4 are gonna be pretty good bluff catches because they block that 5-4 that OTB is wrapping. Besides that, I'm not really sure if Kanu needs to call with a whole lot of extra hands. I think that about that will be about it. Maybe if he decides that he doesn't have enough bluff catches that way, he can look for some extra hands, but it's it's not super easy to find which hands are gonna be the best bluff catches in those spots. But King 5 and King 4 are going to be the clear candidates of reasonable bluff catches here. And let's go back to OTB now. So because Kanu finds good bluff catches in hands like King 5 and King 4, it makes sense for OTB to barrel this river with hands that contain a 5 or a 4 because those hands block some of Kanu's bluff catching range. Maybe you're thinking that that's a bit weird that he's bluff catching with a hand that blocks both value and bluffs. Like, how does that exactly work? And let's have a look at that because I prepared an awesome PowerPoint slideshow just to look at that. So we're going to have to work with a simplified example here. And we're going to start off by assuming that a 4 to 3 value to bluff ratio is correct for the certain bet sizing that is used. This simplifies our example, makes it easier to do the math here. And let's say OTB is betting with the four combos of 5-4 suited and he has corresponding bluffs with 6-5 six, five, su six, five, oh, five suited. But he's not betting every combo 100% of the time. No, he's betting it only 75% of the time, which also leads to a betting range of three full combos. So this is our four combos for value, three combos as a bluff, which leads to a value ratio or a value to bluff ratio or whatever the correct term is here of 70, no, 57.14%. So 57.14% of his river bets in this example are gonna be value combos. So what happens when we call with a bluff catcher like king five suited? In this example, this will remove equal fractions coming both from the value range and from the bluffing range. So this value ratio will stay the same, it has no effect. But when this is going on, we can easily bluff catch with king 4 suited. In this case, we remove one full value combo, but no bluffs. So all of a sudden, the ratio is totally out of whack and OTB is going to be betting with 50% value and 50% bluffs. Uh, and in this case, the bluff catch with king 4 suited is going to be highly profitable. So what OTB is going to want to do is spread out his bluffs and also find some bluffs in the fours. So here I made a bluffing range of 7-5 suited and 7-4 suited, also worked with, worked with fractions so that before removal effects, they still add up to three combos. Now, if we call with king-5 suited, we remove one full value combo and one fraction of bluff combos which leads to a new value ratio of 53%. But remember that to be balanced, the value ratio needed to be 57%. So OTB is incentivized to bluff with these kind of hands, with hands that contain a five or a four, and we are still incentivized to bluff catch with king five and king four because of the way this works. We remove more value combos than we remove bluffing combos. So yes, we remove fraction of both, but the impact on value will be bigger than the impact on bluffs. And 
this way you'll see that picking the correct bluff catchers will make a difference and while OTB is probably betting in some in such a way that a hand like king five suited is slightly profitable or almost break even bluff catcher I'm betting that a hand like king jack isn't going to be printing money at equilibrium at all that is at GTO equilibrium Okay, so now that we have that figured out, I'm gonna replay the whole hand from the start and I'm just gonna let it play out and we'll see the awesome showdown. OTB does have the 5-4 off and Kanu bluff catches with King Jack. So what do we think of this? Well, first of all I want to mention that OTB has 5-4 off suit versus a 3.5 open. So maybe Kanu discounted some of those 5-4 combos because he didn't expect the off suit variety here. I'm not really sure how Preflop ranges look this deep with the high stakes rake, which should be lower than uh, mid stakes rake. Um, and then Kanu's bluff catch. I was already building up to the fact that I don't think he needs to bluff catch with other kings than uh, the good ones. Uh, but maybe Kanu felt like he, he needed to have some extra bluff catches. Then the jack of clubs. How horrible is it to have that one? Usually you don't want to block potential bluffs Villain might show up with. But from OTB's point of view, he doesn't really want to be bluffing too many missed flushes on the river, I think. Because that blocks the range of hands that Kanu calls on the turn but folds on the river. You could say that from that point of view, the jack of clubs in Kanu's hand is kind of neutral. So yeah, you enter this really weird territory where sometimes you do want to block the missed flush draw, sometimes you don't want to block the missed flush draw, and it's not always super intuitive. But this call from Kanu just seems a bit wide and a bit loose. So maybe you just had exploitative reasons to think that OTB might be over bluffing here. So let's do the math on that. Now, okay, so on the river, OTB is betting 4.8 times pot into pot. So Kanu needs to call 4.8 into 5.8. And if you do the calculation, he needs to be good around 45.2% of the time, which also means OTB gets to bluff 45.2% of the time. And if OTB is over bluffing, then well, Kanu can just call with any top pair and make money. Would OTB be over bluffing? I think maybe one train of thought Kanu could have had, <laughs> purely speculation here of course, is that by the time OTB gets the river, it's easy for him to see that, oh, I'm the only one who can have 5-4 off. I, I'm able to overbet jam and Kanu will fold here. Ha ha ha. But from Kanu's point of view, maybe he's thinking that OTB doesn't have the offsuit combos. And maybe Kanu thinks that it's not trivial to bet a lot of 5-4 on the flop. Maybe that's not an easy flop bluff. So maybe he thinks OTB might recognize the spot as him only having the 5-4. But overestimating the amount of 5-4 he really has in his own range at that point in time. Maybe... Something like that is what was happening, but maybe OTB is just a really simple player and he bets big when he has it and he doesn't bet big when he doesn't. So that's it for this hand, that's it for this video. A uh, real flashback from the past, I remember when I saw this hand, I was like, oh my god, what's going on here? These guys are totally out of their minds. And maybe they were, or maybe they were just like super GTO players. 
you never really know what's going on in their heads in the moment. You don't know which exploitative reads they have on each other. Uh, maybe they're into game dynamics. <laughs> Who still does that? It's all about GTO these days. Anyways, I'll see you guys back in the next video. Or almost the end of the video at least. So while I was creating this video, I had prepped this section where I was promoting the advanced cast game course by Kanu, which I'm a fan of. And I have a nice affiliate link to give to you guys so you can buy the course and support the channel at the same time. You don't really get anything extra besides just a warm fuzzy feeling of supporting this YouTube channel and making me feel loved and appreciated. Now my original idea was to put that promo somewhere in the middle but I felt in the end that it was kind of lame to make you wait for the full analysis of the hand. So. I'll just release this promo bit at the end of this video. If you don't care about that, don't watch it. If you do care about a little review of the course or some of my thoughts on the course, go ahead and keep viewing. It's all good. See you guys. So we'll have a look at that hand after I briefly talk about this course that he just released. Because by now I've been through about half this course or, or even more and I'm really impressed by the content. First of all, it is very solver based and I want to say something about solver study and solver related content. So a solver tells you what to do in certain spots, but it doesn't tell you why to do it. And it's easy to kind of fall into the trap. I'll call it a trap. It's, it's still okay in a way, but it's easy to fall into the trap of trying to study the solver patterns and look for spots where you need to bet big and look for spots where you need to bet small and then recognize those patterns in game and um, replicate the solver style bet sizes and strategies. While I think that is possible in a way, like you can study groups of boards for certain positions, let's say button open big blind flats and you do a study where you compare different boards and you see which bet sizes are used. You can get away with trying to learn which kind of hands want to bet big, which kind of hands want to bet small and all that. And sometimes you will know why it is happening, but sometimes your knowledge is kind of limited and you see that a solver does it. So you just do it without really knowing the why. And what I got the most out of the videos I've already seen in this course is the why. Kanu does a solver based analysis, but he really goes out of his way to study the why for all of those plays. It's, it gives you some satisfaction to have a deeper understanding of the underlying fundamental reasons for certain bets and bet sizes. It also makes it easier to recognize these spots while you're playing. If you know why certain things are happening, you can encounter new spots and deduct, go from the why and then know a solver place in a certain way because of those reasons then you can apply those solver style strategies more easier. So while I was very confident in my solver skills I still got a lot out of this Kanu course uh, but I gotta tell you guys it's not just a course that you watch and all of a sudden you're a better player. Well no course is. Well maybe you're a tiny bit better but to fully get everything out of the course you need to watch it, you need to take notes. For me, it encouraged me to do some of my own solver studies again, keeping in mind the lesson that I had learned and study how I could apply those lessons in similar spots or slightly different spots. So um, this is the, the site of the course or the, the landing page of the course, the overview of the course, and we'll end with showing the pretty hefty price. I'll admit it, $9.99. It's not a cheap course and it's also not really aimed at slightly beginning players. But I think if you're playing 100 NL or 200 NL, this is a reasonable price to pay for an elite course out of which you should be able to get a lot of information that will help you get better. And when you can apply those new concepts and when you can apply this new knowledge, you should be able to earn it back. Of course, this is not, this is not a guarantee. Uh, it's not like if you buy this course that you're guaranteed to be a crusher, but it should increase your odds. And yeah, I just mentioned 100 and 200 now. If you're playing higher, you probably can still get a lot out of this course. 
And let's say you're playing lower, but poker isn't your source of income or your only source of money. Let's say you're playing 25 or 50 NL, but you have some income from other sources and you really like poker as a hobby and you do want to put in the money and effort to get better, then this course could also be something for you. If you're still on the fence, there's a couple of free videos that Kanu made as a prequel to this course being released. They were put out on the Upswing YouTube channel, YouTube channel, and I will also link them down below. I think they are a good representation of how Kanu thinks and talks about poker. If you hate those videos, then you probably shouldn't buy the course. If they pique your interest, maybe you can give it a thought. And if you consider buying the course, you can also consider buying the link that I will provide. It is a affiliate link, meaning that if you buy the course through that link, you don't really get anything extra besides that warm, fuzzy feeling of supporting this channel and supporting me. Um, but if you don't want to do that, but you still like the course, you can also go to upswingpoker.com and just find the course over there somewhere.